musicians and bars and beer. Doug Elliott, tell us about your music. I grew up a uh, very heavy Led Zeppelin fan. Um, so most of what I do, um, it's got a, a John Bonham feel to it, like a Chad Smith, um, very soulful and um, very hard hitting. Um, I'm not really a great technical proficient drummer. Um, I can carry a great beat and I love to play. That's right. Are you in a band? No, no, no. I play like not in a band band, but we have a jam band that we have together with um, Maddie and Leon from the Lazies and uh, Mike Turner comes out and plays with us uh, a couple times. Come on, you've got a jam band with the Lazies. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's yeah, yeah. And then um, my buddy Dave McDonald, he's a photographer. He does most of all the uh, photography for all of our, like for our radio station. And I, he and I go back a hundred years um, and he, he plays bass and I play the drums. And then um, between, between Maddie and uh, Mike Turner, we've got cover, uh, guitars covered. And then uh, we just got to keep Leon focused enough <laughs> with the lyrics. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. We get into some pretty cool, um, some pretty cool renditions. We did, uh, the uh, in excess Jimmy Barnes version of Good Times um, in a jam that we've got going on, a pretty cool vibe to it. So, kind of updated it a little bit, taking that 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 in excess feel and kind of added the lazies and a little Our Lady Peace feel to it. So it's it's cool. That's great. It's got to be danceable. Uh, you could dance to it. I think after a couple of pints, anybody could dance to the song. That's great. Um, Okay, so do you jam in Oxford? Uh, no, we usually, I usually come into town. We get one of the spaces at like the uh, uh, rehearsal factory or there's a, uh, is it Cherry Beach Studios? Cherry, yeah. Cherry Beach Studios. So we, either one of those two places. Everybody else is in the city. I'm the only one out here. The reason I interjected there was because Oshawa's music scene is becoming quite huge. It's, uh, it's the really center of attention right now. Yeah, it is. It is. It's. Um, that's because of you guys. I, I don't know if, if say it's because of us. I think that we've kind of helped. I think it's like part of the environment. I don't think it's necessarily one thing altogether. Um, I, I don't think there's one one institution or or one thing. I think it's it's just a culmination of a lot of energy at one time that is sort of. Know, brought an awareness or were um, um yeah actually it's funny you should say that because I, I i left the music hall i went down to the music hall before the shutdown the new what's going to be the new music hall yeah. um and it's um where kind of exactly where the the old music hall was on king street they're on bond which is like a block north um so it's going to be uh, three floors. The, the main floor, it's a huge, huge building. The main floor is going to be 1,200 people. So 1,250 actually. So it'll be like the size of uh, the Danforth or the Phoenix. Um, they'll have uh, about 500 in the basement. And then they have a, uh, a what'll be a, a upscale restaurant up on the third floor. Um, and then plans for next year is to put up a rooftop patio. So it'll be four floors of entertainment in total. There'll be a bunch of different things within this environment. Um, and I, I think it'll be a game changer for out here. I think all of a sudden you'll have, um, you know, those bands that come in and they're too small to play the, the ACC, but they'll do two, three nights um, at a, you know, Danforth Music Hall, um, they'll end up probably playing a couple nights here too. I mean, you know, it's Jeremy. Like Danko Jones or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Danko, a big rack, you know, somebody along in that level. Um, you, you might even see some of the bigger bands come in and play as well, you know, like when they do their, their club tour stuff. I mean, I think the Foo Fighters are kind of reinventing how the touring model is going to happen, right? It doesn't all have to be big venues like massive you know and you lose that intimacy the bands do that they don't get that that direct feedback because there's you know 100 feet between you and that row of bouncers 
you know, in the photography pit. <laughs> so, so there's that, and then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we also like when I started here at the radio station, we we started working on a uh, how can we take and help bands that have got nothing right now. Like if you're not signed to a major label uh, and you've got that promo machine behind you, how do you get your profile up? So we started with the program. We uh, started the Generation Next program. Kind of like it, it's an all-encompassing thing. It involves some live element like later on as well that we got to. Um, and so we work with like 104 acts or bands over the course of a year to really highlight and spotlight the music. We take them, we get the tunes, we put it on the radio. We've got uh, Canadian producer Brian Moncars to host it all. And he listens to the music ahead of time and comes up with this summation of what the band's about from uh, you know the, the producer's year. Um, we do that. And then we also do a live component with the Phoenix. We've, uh, we partnered with the Phoenix eight year, eight, nine years ago, um, to start these shows where we would do, you know, three, four, five acts in a night. They would do about a 35, 40 minute showcase, get up, play their best tunes. Um, wow. The crowd get off. And we made it an event. Like we started out doing you know, four or 500 people, which in the Phoenix, when you're standing on the floor is pretty, pretty, pretty empty because it's, you know, thousand people on the floor. Um, but by the time we started wrapping it up pre COVID, we were getting, you know, 12, 1300 people per show. Um, and, you know, to go see four or five unknown bands for, I don't even know what cover was like 10, $12 or something. You know, you get out, you see five bands, two bucks a piece type thing. And you're really helping that, that local community. And then these bands started to play. And then next time we'd have them back, like two years later, they played a 200 people say, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, they would bring in their 200 people, but then the next time they'd come out because the other crowd was to see the other bands, they had more fans. And then those people would come back out again to see them. So next time they brought out 400 people. Give us some examples of some of the Gen X bands that you're uh, talking about. Uh, Glorious Sons. Yeah. Um, we first saw them at the Dakota in 2012. 2012. East End uh, Actually, they're from Kingston. Yeah. And they then just call that East End downtown. They're 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 like really East End. Yeah. <laughs> um. And then we did, um, what else we do? Um, Secret Broadcast is another one of those bands. We did the, the uh, they're now called the Mashstick Skeletons, but they were Head of the Herd. Um, they had a, a number one song. We do, uh, oh, Crownlands is probably one of the, the greatest, latest discoveries that we, uh, that we had. Our, um, our very own Lee Eckley became friends with them, going to see them play in the local clubs. And, uh, got on them like right away became friends and, and then has really mentored that relationship into something amazing yeah and now they're 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 like this close away from superstardom right yeah yeah so um yeah 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 very much uh clea patrick is another another one of those bands they're uh twosome from uh from Coburg um now they've i think number five in the u.s is where they peaked out with uh with hometown and uh my god one bad son is another one of those bands um kurt doll the drum yeah, they're very west end saskatoon um but one thing this has done though is it's drawn and the, the word gets out because the, the music community is so small right um, the word gets out between all these bands across the country because they're all going to tour together. They all know each other. And then they all share that information. They're like, hey, get your stuff to these guys because they'll do the help of that. So um, we've really built up and we really fostered a great community. One thing I always hated was like the battle of the bands where you'd pit all of these bands against each other. They'd all leave the end of the night hating whoever the, the judges were and that one band that won. So you really have, you know, four or five people, 
you have four or five people that win and it's the band or the solo artist and everybody else is pissed off. So I thought, well, why don't we do something that builds as opposed to pits people against each other? Um, yeah, so now we build this community where you go out and like a lot of times you go see the bands at Gen Next and, and a lot of other bands come out to support their friends. So you'll be standing in the crowd and you'll see a lot of people that you've seen on stage before. So they all get to know each other and they're all good friends. And, and it's really great to see that support network as opposed to having a bunch of guys trying to take each other out of the knees all the time. Yeah. They're working at ways to really build the community. It's like the best thing that it can happen for the world of rock and roll um, is that we have a, a, a really great collection of musicians who want to play, who want to play well and are very uh, proud of their craft. And then they all want to build stuff together, right? They know that the success of one band is better for their success as well. I mean, we had um, uh, arguments with a bunch of bands when Greta Van Fleet came out a couple of years ago. And uh, most of the musicians that I were talking to at the time were pissed off. Um, and I think it was, and I called them on it. I said it was just a... Uh, uh, jealous professional jealousy fits um, because a band really out of nowhere came out and just fucking took over the music scene in North America and then in the world as well uh, and there was like well they're not playing any of their own original material and I think do you think Zeppelin did in 68 you know they, they took Willie Dixon's catalog re-recorded it said it was their own and people are thinking they're the next best thing it's the same thing but the, the difference is at least well, we, we, we don't know this yet, but we think that Greta Van Fleet's music is all original. We don't think they stole it from any old blues man, thinking nobody would ever find out. But the, the difference is, too, right now you've got bands that are like, you know, 20, 22, 24-year-olds playing really cool rock and roll for 22, 24-year-olds, as opposed to the, uh, the, the recycling of the big old touring bands. You know, Foo Fighters have been together 25 years. These guys are all in their early 50s now. Metallica, upper 50s. Um, you know, what relevant... Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what relevant messaging do they have to a 24-year-old right now? I look at the music industry as as three three chunks. There's uh, pre-Nirvana, which is your, you know, your classic rock, your chicks and cars. And, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, first thing imaging that comes to my mind is like the, the Motley Crue and the Decade of Decadence and Excess yeah. and, uh, you know, for us old timers going to Rock and Roll Heaven or, or the Gasworks or uh, Larry's Hideaway, Nags Head, all of those places that were relevant then. And then there was from 90s to about say Nir Nirvana till around Nickelback. There's that, that decade of grunge and pop and pop rock and rock was like rock and alternative. It was so huge. It was mammoth. It was the, it was the biggest musical genre uh, available at the time. And you, you know, your, your big radio stations in every market you went to in North America were the, uh, the, the rock alternative stations. And then, um, and then after Nickelback-ish, like the, the, the post- what I call the post grunge decade where um, the music industry started catering to a heavier, angrier sound. Um, they started losing the fun of, uh, and the communication of rock and roll. Interesting. So what do you call that? Post grunge. Post grunge. Yeah. Post apocalyptic. Well, it's like the double knots, right? Anything after like 2000 has got a, totally different feel i think that in the last five years we're really getting back to a different spot in the world of rock and roll you look at the um the the music scene like right across the board pop country um it's canadian dominance right now drake um the weekend um uh, alicia cara um and i'm probably forgetting a whole bunch uh megan patrick um You've got, you know, I love it. Love them. I mean, this is the thing that this, the funniest thing is you look at the, the digital listening um, on, on Nickelback and everybody likes to jump on the bandwagon if they hate Nickelback. But I'll tell you what, the most listened to Canadian band uh, in the world of rock and roll is Nickelback.
there's no, no, nobody's even close. Three Days Grace is a close second. Um, but the Nickelback tracks and everybody listens to them. I mean, every time you go and you play a stream on one of your, one of your different platforms, um, it, there's a metadata that's there and it gets caught by, like it's picked up. Um, so everybody knows when you're listening to music, everybody says they don't listen to Nickelback. Oh, I hate them. Um, that would be a vocal minority because everybody, everybody has to listen to Nickelback based on the numbers that I see. And oh, yeah. I mean, all the power to them because I think that they do really, really cool stuff. Um, and you know, I, I, I mean, suffice it to say that there probably hasn't been a bigger band and they've been out for like, what, 20 odd years now. And they're still, still doing really, really well. They've got their... It was unpopular to be a Rush fan at the time. But, uh, oh, but of course. They came back into popularity. So Nickelback will have their day again. Yeah, there always was that. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing about being Canadian too, is when one of our acts gets really big, then we like to take them down at the knees. I don't know yeah. why. Hey, you know. I, I, a sellout or something. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I totally sold out. And I'm like, why? Because they're playing the Super Bowl? Yeah. yeah it's it. Your logic doesn't make any great sense, but no. nice argument. Well, um, what about, let's go into uh, uh, where you think things are going. Uh, um, I don't know necessarily what the touring model is going to look like. I think it's going to be a lot different. I think the uh, bands, agents, managers are going to have to look at um, more of a, uh, um, like a revenue sharing as opposed to a guarantee where, um, you know, if your band is selling big, um, you're, you might get like a 25% guarantee. And then if you cap out, then you'll get a larger percentage on that 75%. Um, you know, that that's kind of, I think, the way the business model is going to have to go. Um, and I think it's going to have to be more of a, a different structure. It's going to be really, I mean, the bands are going to be more like salespeople and they're going to have to be working to sell the rooms and working their socials and stuff. Um, I, I think that um, when it comes back, it's going to be extremely, extremely healthy. Um, all signs, all economic indicators are that this is going to be like the roaring 20s on steroids. Um, just look at the house prices across North America right now. Canada is like crazy. Um, so, is there be like, a new glam era? like all good, like all good music movements, is going to start ground very grassroots, and it's going to start with a real street level punk movement. It's going to be three and four piece kids like bands, and, and they're going to be young. And they're going to be pissed off because they can't buy a house. They'll never be ready to go. It's um, it's going to be even more anti-boomer stuff um, that's going to be brought up by the kids. I mean, the, the, the guitar sales since um, COVID started have been through the roof. Most places can't keep good guitars on their shelves. Wow, that's great news, though. Yeah, prices are going through the roof and kids are playing guitar. They're, you know, what else are you doing? You're sitting inside. I mean, it's old school. You're sitting inside with back and black and listening to it, trying to rip the riffs off. And then you graduate, then you graduate to uh, some Zeppelin and then you graduate to Randy Rhodes. And then you get into Malmsteam and, and all these different technical dudes, you know? And I, I hear you. And I, I think you're going to get a lot of really angry kids um, from suburbia as suburbia grows and the bands are going to look different. They're going to be multicultural. They're going to have a lot of different sounds and they're going to bring a lot more to the plate. And then as they get better, you're going to have refined sounds. Like, I mean, out of the biggest punk movement in the West coast came the grunge movement. Um, you know, Duff McKagan is a punker uh, and was total punk. He went down to LA and it, by fluke ended up getting into Guns N' Roses and playing like, well, I would say the end of glam metal with gun, the, the original Guns N' Roses. Yeah. Um, you know, Cornell, I, I always thought he was a like a Mass Sabbath fan. And I, I was talking to him at Massey Hall and I'm like, you know, what was your favorite Sabbath tune? He goes, dude, I'm not into arena rock, never was. You know, like I explained, I said, just, you know, with the back cording and the riffs and Kim's guitar and that SG sound, he's like, Never thought of it before, but now we're punkers, man. We just punk, yeah. and we just kind of settled into this groove. 
Um, and I, I think that that's where we're going to come out of it again. I think there's going to be a new movement and, um, and, and, and I think it's going to, I mean, the one thing that COVID is, is a great interrupter and it's going to cause a lot of things to change. Um, but everything is cyclical and you notice that the pop music love is dwindling right now. Um, it, there's hardly any love for it anymore and more people are going to rock and roll and they're consuming much more rock than they have in years and that young crowd that used to listen to you know Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift and they're they're finding this new music that's that's about depth and layers and lyrics that are more about oh girl I miss you girl yeah. you, know, you know it's just Absolutely. yeah it's just a lot more depth to it texture there's no Ryan Seacrest on your station, is there? Uh, no, I've got Lee Eckley. <laughs> I, I don't need Seacrest. I got Lee Eckley. Lee Eckley's probably like the longest running radio guy, like consistently employed radio guy in the cities. I, I grew up listening to to Beef when he worked at Q in the uh, in the late seventies. Yeah. Um, and have had the pleasure of working with him for the last decade. The guy's like a freaking genius and he's smooth slick um and he's been around he's been through it all um you know and his love of new music keeps keeps him going i mean and he he literally curates the uh, the generation next program on his own it works with brian Moncards on a lot of it but that's how people get their new music out they send it to him he brings it to the table and then, uh, you know, we play it on the Gen, Gen X. We get the bands out, do the, the, the shows at the uh, the Phoenix, build up their profile a little bit. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you've got record companies sniffing around trying to find these bands. Um, so some of these Gen X guys are, uh, are indie that had no uh, management presence. They're not, they're yeah. not buying their way in sort of thing. And you're just you're hearing their stuff and, and you're yeah. liking it. Yeah, I mean, look at uh, uh, Glorious Sons, for example. I mean, we we caught them uh, at the the Drake that night, and um, I kind of followed up with them a little bit, and then they got did they get management? Who's it? I think I think Ralph James signed them right away um, to his uh, to his agency, the agency group at the time, and then and Ralph and I become you know really good buds. Uh, cause we have a lot of music in common. And then he was working with me to try to get these guys in places and, and featured and stuff. Right. So we did that next thing, you know, we were doing their, uh, album release at the hard rock, uh, probably 2014. I'm trying to so remember exactly. Days, guys used to do that strategy with the record company, trying to get their stuff heard by record people. Now it's like, are you just saying that? You know these independent radio stations are taking the place of those that that kind of place on the ladder well i, I don't know necessarily i mean i i don't know i don't know much about the a and r departments in the record companies anymore but i know that they're not they're not into band development anymore it's about um you know for the a lot of the bands that want to get going they need to find alternative ways to be able to get their crowd up um most most radio unfortunately has turned their backs to helping and working with new music and they they're playing you know uh aside from my station um majority of the rock stations in the city all play stuff that's about 25 years old so there's there's no element to be able to to get the new music or they they do play it and if they do play it it's already once it's an established song so it's a big hit but they're not working with the bands. They're not listening to it. They're not going to the shows and they're not cultivating the relationships and really, you know, working with the bands to be able to help them out. I mean, like, you know, like that's one thing I liked about when I, when I was a kid and I, I growing up listening to Q, um, they did that stuff. You know, they were out at the shows with the bands and, um, if they said that there's a band you got to go see, it was like an endorsement all of a sudden. It's like, okay, cool. I got to take note on these guys. Or, you know, and I come home and watch um, much music and I'd see a, a video for a band. Um, there was that reinforcement that there was some kind of cool factor to it. And the thing is, is that it was, it was a much wider perspective 
on the bands that were presented. And now everything is so narrow and niche. And it's, and it's almost like, we're not going to bother with you. Media is like that. We're not going to bother with you until you're already big. Um, and then, well, then we want nothing. We want nothing but your time until we're done with you. Then you're disposable. That's how the rock differs. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't want those relationships like that. I want to have like long-term relationship with bands that are established that, and I want the bands to think of us as, as the station that, that they can work with that will, you know, go and play. We'll, we'll be at the shows too. You know, we're, we're at the shows. We know the guys we're, we're with them all. And, we're part of the community. We're part of the solution to, to really helping, you know, and I think that was, I'm sorry to jump in there. That's okay. um, I think you hosted a show at uh, the Boba, uh, um, the wild or something. Yeah. 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 No, no, that probably might've been through something with like either Indie week. We, um, were the, the media sponsor for Indie week Canada. Um, it's going to be what is yeah. it? The end of April this this year. Usually it's November, uh, but with COVID this year, everything had everything is all over the place. Also, been Canadian Music Week. We do a lot with uh, with CMW as well. Yeah, those are really um, integral parts of development. That's for sure, and I, I appreciate that because I go to a lot of those shows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's they're imperative that that those kind of things and and they happen. Those conferences where people can can mill and unfortunately that's exactly the the what they call the super spreaders right now right yeah. so i can hardly wait till we can get back to those days when we can all be together and gathered and talking strategy and we get so many great ideas and you know so let's hit that woodstock question it was uh, right out of the movie a guy um shows up on the scene there you know it's all muddy and everything and this guy shows up it's like straight out of Britain in his uh, loafers and his umbrella handy. Yep. And, and he asks, why is, why is music the great community? And the greatest answers I've ever heard came out of these kids on the brown acid. So you give it a shot. I'm not on brown acid. Well, it's only 11 a.m. Well, I mean, and that would be the time to stop because I could be down by like dinner time. <laughs> um, I, I think music is the great communicator because it's a couple things. It allows you to be able to present an intrinsic idea or feeling in an emotional way. And it also allows you to connect in, um, in a way within the brain that, that can open somebody's brain up to different interpretations. And, and it, it really plays with neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, there are certain tribal rhythmic things that are very basic about a great beat. Um, it's a call. It can be a call to arms. It can be a call of passion. Um, it can be you bawling your face off because something happened. It can be cathartic to get over tragedy. It can be a great comedy. It can be a spoof. It can be I'm pissed off and fuck you and... Um, it can be all of those things on one record, you know, um, it could be all those things in 20 minutes on a, on a radio station. Um, and the key thing with music is that it's, it's got depth of soul to it and it really does something in the brain. I mean, there's a reason why you can know every word to let shake and you haven't heard it in 30 years. You know, so, but as soon as you hear the opening bit of the drum beat, you know, you're like, okay, I'm in, I'm in. You know, why do I know, why do I know the, the lyrics to Caruso Lambra from Zeppelin? I don't know. I, 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 that doesn't make any good sense. Most of the words don't make any sense. You know, it, it's like Super Tramp album covers. Why do I, you know, but there's that connection to it. You look at it and you're trying to get your head around the riddle, the puzzle, and you're trying to figure it out, um, you know, and, and, and it's also a great theater of the brain because the songs tell a story or they're telling you something and your brain is, is got your own little movie theater on how it plays it out within your brain. You picture things, um, 
Yeah, the imagery is really can be really strong when it's done well. And I think, you know, based on like, that's why I got into doing what I do is because I sucked at drums. Um, I, I would have never I, I realized quite on or early on that I, I just didn't have the chops to be able to make it on a professional level. Yeah, I, I, I probably could go all day about it because um, I mean, for me, music's a passion, right? Like it it's, it doesn't matter what you're listening to. I, I like to, um, I'm around contemporary rock all day. I, I go home, sometimes I'll pop on Celtic rock and I'll listen to um, a playlist that somebody else has curated and it's a bunch of bands who I got no clue who they are. Um, and that's kind of good because I'm hearing new things and I'm, I'm exposing myself to different uh, thoughts. I'm on a kick lately too. I've been listening to a lot of um, Iranian classical music it, and it's of similarities. Like my side of my, my mother's side of the family are all Hungarian. And I hear the similarity between the old traditional Hungarian music and the Iranian music. And also a lot of the Russian stuff as well, like a lot of Russian music. Um, so I, I see a tie in of all that culture and that I've been exploring my Scottish roots uh, which is where the, the Celtic stuff comes from. I listen to a lot of a lot of jazz. I've been listening to a lot of like uh, jazz master stuff, a lot of stuff that um, it's a really cool vibe. You know, sometimes when I have people over for a dinner when we're not in COVID, I'll pop on like a big band playlist that I'll make. And you, I, it, it just, yeah, but it opens up so much to you. Like last weekend on sa Saturday morning, I think I woke up and I just decided I want to listen to Merle Haggard. My parents were big Merle Haggard fans. I, growing up, couldn't stand them. Uh, just because it was that rebellion thing, right? Because um, you couldn't like what your parents like because that would be really dorky and square. I was a big fan of Blue Rodeo in the late 80s. I was working on Queen Street at the time. Um, and it had that, at that point in time, we called it the, it was the Queen Street sound, right? I mean, there was a lot of bands that, that, that were around the bamboo at the time. And I think Blue Rodeo were probably, no, the bamboo. Uh, I remember it well. I remember going, I remember sitting at x-rays at the corner there of John and Queen or not John, Peter. Which street was that? Queen and John was where uh, much music was. So it was the one to the east. Um, and you'd sit there and you'd see all of these what we call at the time freaks and okay i fit right in with them at the time right um and it had a whole vibe to it that part of town and and there was a a countrified rock that was really had a feel to it you know it's almost almost like a um like a sophisticated stray cats for lack of a better term and i think you listen to like outskirts has got a little bit of that that feel to it, right? I mean, and, yeah. and then, and then, um, what was next? Yeah, casino? Was cash yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you get into casino. Casino was much more sophisticated, and it started oh, to yeah. lean into the rock world. And and uh, I think that's where where Bobby Wiseman's keyboards kind of took a little more influence over it. But if you listen to um, like uh, uh, Trust Yourself or To Lie Myself Again or or Diamond Mine. They've got a um, a feel in time, you know, and it's it's funny because it takes you right to that spot and that feeling and well for me anyway. I, I thought uh, it was funny that Terry Brown, who uh, did Twenty One Twelve, also did um, you know Blue Rodeo song. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's 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 I mean you know look at Bob Ezrin and all of the uh, all of the uh, all of his his catalog and and him doing all of um, all of Alice's stuff forever, you know, and then and then doing Pink Floyd's The Wall, which was like a absolute masterpiece. And then you know you've got uh, um, Jack Richardson doing the Guess Who and Seeger and all of that, and then uh, his kid doing Rage. And, and everything else that G -G -G has done. It's just, it's insane. Yeah. Um, Actually, I've, I've uh, got two more questions now. Sure. <laughs> uh, 
I always ask for a funny story from the road, but uh, I also want to want to know um, perhaps who you've really enjoyed speaking with over the years. One of my one of my favorite people to talk to uh, because he's probably the smartest guy in any room he ever walks into is uh, is Mike Turner. Mike Mike used to play with Our Lady Peace. He was the guitar player in the band, um, and actually is like a rocket scientist. He's by far the smartest guy that I've ever met in my life. And uh, Did what you he say a rocket scientist? Yes, he he is like an actual rocket scientist. That's amazing. Yeah, and he's he's now producing music. Um, which I mean, which is awesome, right? Yeah. So yeah, um, and we can get into conversations, and most of the conversations I find, instead of me having anything to say, which which usually, I mean, as you've noticed. I'm usually not, not at a loss for anything, it, but he's the kind of guy you can sit there and listen to because he's so well rounded on so many uh, uh, different topics, and um, he's lived it. He's been through the ringer and back, and uh, he tells you the, the road stories of you know playing. Um, and he's you know they're up on stage and uh, he looks over to his right and there's uh, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page on the side stage just watching it and I'm like, oh, did you shit your pants? Well, maybe a little bit, you know. So I mean, and that's always that's always really cool. I I one of my favorite interviews I've ever done um, was um, Chris Cornell. I got to talk to him a couple of weeks before he died. Um, he was. Uh, apparently he was in a really dark place um but when we hung out he wasn't it was supposed to be a 15 minute interview and it turned into about an hour um and i i apologize to every other media person that was supposed to talk to him but i kind of stole the whole time we the two of us just hit it off you know it's one of those situations where um you just start having a conversation with somebody and it becomes organic and you just throw out all of your questions because you don't need them anymore because you're already on a different train of thought and it's it, it's a better train of thought than you would have been when it was predetermined right so um, That's what I for. yeah um hanging with well, one of my bucket list items was hanging with jimmy page um and uh and uh, uh edge uh adam and uh, bono uh, was really cool as well. Edge and I, we, we started talking about, um, um, got into a long conversation. One of his favorite things is to go uh, rug shopping in Morocco. So and it's one of my favorite, one of, one, of, one of those bucket list places I've never been to, but he goes quite often. It's so close to uh, uh, to Dublin as well, right? It's just like an hour flight or something in, in America or Tangiers or whatever he goes. So what was the other question? traveling in the markets and things like that that's lovely just, just to experience the cultures oh too bad we're all missing that but the other question was a funny story from the road from me and speaking of uh, great great stories you, you mentioned bob segarini earlier you told me a great jimmy um uh, jim morrison story which uh i got some great rock royalty in toronto and uh why don't you uh, your rock royalty too man your whole station everybody there i love y'all Thank Tell you. Something, uh, you know, you just actually you just said the, the one about Jimmy Page, so that might be your story from the road. But you must have a funny anecdote from the road. I got a phone call from CBC. We did a, a, a whole kind of uh, protest when I got to the Rock. We started this whole thing like, why aren't Rush in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? And we we literally stood down at um, Young and Dundas Square. Um, and we broadcast from the, the, the studio. We, uh, we took over the studio there and would get people to drop by and sign a petition. And it became quite the thing after a while. Next thing we know, we've got Rush on the bill and they're getting uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So then um, somebody, producer at CBC, gets onto it at the National. And then um, next thing I know, I've got the National uh, while I'm on air, shooting me on the air, doing an interview, uh, then I'm I'm on with um, Mansbridge. Jeez, when was that now? I can't remember when the show. I remember it was really hot out. And then I got a phone call from CBC, and they said, "Hey, listen, can you come down to the ACC tonight?" 
and uh, be there. We want to do an interview with you again um, for their what will probably be their last show. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I went down for that. And then a friend of mine who works with the band got one of those uh, side laminates, you know, like the all access ones, like the super duper all access ones and uh, threw it on my leg. And we went and watched the, uh, the last show um, standing right in front of the soundboard. That was the coolest. Um, I wasn't fully expecting to even to stay for the show. I thought I'd be there for like the interview and then have to leave because I didn't have a ticket. And it's like, no, don't worry about it, man. Come on, you're with us. Let's go. It's like one of those situations where you get, you get kind of get whisked up by the people that are around you who are on a much larger scale of life and you don't realize what or why it's happening. They're just taking you with them. Come on, we're going. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Here's my keys. <laughs> yeah. Rush. Who loves Rush? Everybody. Do yourself a favor and go listen to um, uh, Frantic City and, and then listen to the first Tragically Hip uh, EP. I think, they're, I think they're about three or four years apart and you'll hear the similarity. I never really put it together until I was listening to them in sequence that the, the teenage or teenage head left off, the Tragically Hip kind of picked up at. Sonically, it's very, very similar. Cool, uh, yeah just give it give it a listen do yourself a favor and do that little listen and you'll be oh yeah okay there's another band that i interviewed in the uh, green room at the horseshoe was teenage head teenage head at the horseshoe it was unreal <laughs> it was unreal if only frankie was there yeah was see I, I grew up in oakville um and my whole my whole drive was to go see the kings play the riverside um you know wanted to wait it turned 18 Go see the Kings of the Riverside or Anvil, one of the two. Uh, but I never made it. Uh, I never started going into town, obviously, till I was a little older, till I could, uh, you know, do a fake mustache and try to get into uh, into somewhere. Uh, you know, I saw, I uh, talked to Rob at the Rock Pile, uh, but you know they're bigger elsewhere, aren't they? They're big around the world. Who's that? Anvil. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they were. They were huge. Huge around the world. Yeah. Like Saga, huge in Germany, and David Hasselhoff. No, seriously. Yeah. You know who else is the same way too? Uh, in Europe, Mammoth is um, uh, Danko. Danko's huge over in Europe. Amazing. Goes over a place like 15, 20, 25,000 people. Billy Talent. We we're getting a picture sent to me from the talents. They're, they're playing to 70,000 people in Germany. Fantastic. They are lazies too. They, they were over there. They're playing to like 30,000 people at Wicked. Huge. There's another Queen Street band, right? Was that? Billy Talent. Ah, yeah, exactly. Opened yeah. up for Guns N' Roses last time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was awesome. Yes, it was. It was really good. I saw them about a couple, maybe three months earlier at the um, ACC Scotiabank, whatever it was at the time. Can't, I can't remember we were in building naming rights at that time. Um, but they played, and then before the encore, they went dark, and um, Alexis on Fire came out and did... Uh, is it three or four tracks? Wow. Oh, man, it was totally cool. They just ripped it a new one. And then, um, it was it again, too. You know, we're talking about great movements that, that spawned from that punk feel, too. So, Woohoo! Doug Elliott, thanks for being on Musicians in Bars Getting Beer. It's been a great conversation. Absolutely. We're going to have to edit half of that stuff out because it's too dirty. Ah, keep the dirty <laughs> stuff. That's the, that's the stuff everybody wants to hear. They don't want to hear the boring stuff. They want the dirt. Rock Royalty 94.9, The Rock. Cheers. All right. Thanks, Billy. I'll be following you on the, uh, on the uh, Facebook mostly. What do you use? Uh, yeah, I use Facebook and Insta. I wouldn't use any of it if I didn't have to. You're a Facebooker? Yeah, I do. I do like all the platforms. Although if I didn't have to, I wouldn't. I, I would be Johnny Johnny Anonymous. But I have to have a, I have to have a profile for stuff. Your personality. Yeah, apparently. Thanks for being on the show. My pleasure, buddy. Have a great day. Okay, Steve. Cheers. Bye.